Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Sullivan. I'm the executive director at the Free Software Foundation. Uh, I am not going to answer all the questions uh, Simon tried to pass to me just now, but uh, I will talk about some of the things and the, the discussion in particular about privacy from Doc at the beginning of the panel is a really nice segue into what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, so the title of this talk is How Can Free Communication Tools Win? And I just want to start by reminding everybody what the mission of the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project is, which is that we want people, all users, everywhere to be able to do everything they need to do with any computer, whether it's a big computer or a small computer, uh, using only free software. So in our perfect world, there's no such thing as proprietary software. All software can be inspected, shared, modified by its users or people that they uh, pay or enlist to do that. And this is obviously, it's a huge mission. It's gonna take many years to accomplish. Uh, it seems to be getting bigger every year with all the different kinds of computers that are coming out in our cars and appliances, et cetera. Um, just think about all the ways proprietary software is now embedded and accepted in our societies. Um, it's supported by regulations and government policies, financial subsidies, social inertia, network effects. It's used in our school systems. Uh, it's everywhere. So with that, you might ask, uh, you know, why we want to talk about communication tools. In particular, all software should be free software. Um, but I think communication tools are a particularly important area of software that deserve a special kind of focus and require a special kind of approach. So this is the first time I've given this talk, uh, but I gave a similar talk a few years ago in 2013 at the Open World Forum in Paris. It was called, What Do You Mean You Can't Skype? Um, because at that time, you know, Skype was the primary thing I always had to refuse to use um, as a committed free software person. But in the last five years, it's gotten, the situation's gotten much worse. Uh, so we actually need to talk about many other things besides just Skype now. And my goal here in talking about this at all is to try to have some impact on accelerating the conversation in this area in the community, uh, maybe try to convince you to raise the priority of this particular part of the, uh, of the movement in your own practices and whatever areas you have control over, uh, and to you know, maybe stimulate some contributions from people who can write the needed code, supply some of the needed funding, do some of the needed testing, documentation writing, you know, all these things that we need for free software projects to succeed. Um, so you might wonder why I have any expertise to talk about this. Uh, my best answer is just longevity. <laughs> so I've been with the FSF since 2003, so it's been 15 years of full-time free software advocacy. Uh, I do also have an MFA in poetry, which I am told makes me an unacknowledged legislator of the universe. Uh, so that helps with everything. Um, but I also have had a, a passion in free software for communication tools in particular. You know, most to the extent I have technical knowledge, I learned most of it from IRC conversations over the years with people that were very generous with their knowledge. Uh, and I was uh, part of the short-lived Open Moco craze, um, working very hard at helping, trying to help that succeed. And one of the great parts about my job is I get to spend a lot of time talking with people who really are experts in, in these areas, and I get to learn from them and try to share some of uh, what I learned with other people. There is also the irony that I have to identify of, of me talking about communication topics. I happen to be a pretty extreme introvert, um, pretty strongly associated with one-word text messages that usually just say, okay. So I have to say that, you know, most of the free software tools support that kind of communication uh, just fine. But, you know, I, I know people want a lot more. So we're going to talk a bit about the depressing part first, how we've been losing at communication tools, um, talk about why it's particularly bad that we're losing in this area, then look on the brighter side of what we have now, uh, what do we need to do to win the rest of the way. And by win, I think we mean free software tools are the most commonly used communication tools by everybody and eventually the only communication tools used by everybody. Uh, and then conclusions, ideas for how you can help, and uh, some thoughts about where we're going from here. And then finally, uh, Q&A, or you, know, you tell me, actually, I have everything wrong, and that's fine. So uh, how we've been losing. The Just look at the list of some popular proprietary tools people are using for communication. And my definition of popular here is very unscientific. Basically, the definition is ones I've heard of and know people who use. But this is, uh, this is notable because I know most of my social circle and professional circle are free software people. 
So um, even though they're very committed to free software, I still uh, come across a lot of people using all of these tools. We have Slack, uh, WhatsApp, which apparently has 1.5 billion monthly users. That's pretty popular. Uh, Skype, Snapchat, Twitter, in particular direct messages. I know people that use Twitter as essentially a private communication platform. Facebook Messenger, FaceTime, iMessage, Google Hangouts, Google Allo, Google, Allo, Google Duo, Hangouts Chat, Hangouts Meet. I can't keep up with all of the Google things that are happening. I didn't even know about Allo and Duo until I started putting these slides together. But apparently that's what's shipping on the Pixel phones in place of Hangouts. And there's a little bit of a scope issue here in this talk. I'm mixing up some different kinds of tools. Um, I want to focus primarily on one-to-one -one tools that are designed for one-to-one -one private communication uh, as one category, and then uh, primarily public or group conversation tools as another. But as I was trying to you know, make these categories make sense, I sort of realized it's, they're not very clean because people do unexpected things with communication tools. Uh, people using Twitter as a private communication platform or uh, people who use the chat functionality of multiplayer online games to just talk to each other without even playing the game. So, you know, we're more talking about what people do with the tools as opposed to what they're necessarily designed to do. Um, another thing to notice about all these projects is that they're all gratis. None of them cost any money. Uh, some of them have business models where you can pay them extra in order to get special services, but they all have, you know, a baseline um, offering which doesn't cost anybody any money. And, th and that's really, as we know, the hardest kind of proprietary software for us to deal with is when it doesn't cost any money because that's one of our main advantages, even though it's not what defines free software is, that it's usually low cost or no cost to the user. Besides the uh, popular proprietary tools, we've seen a, a decline of standard-based tools. Okay, AIM's not a standard-based tool, but let's you know all pour one out for the death of Instant Messenger last year. Um, we saw Facebook shift away from XMPP, which is what used to drive uh, Facebook chat and used to be able to talk to users on Facebook using just another Jabber client. That That is uh, no longer true. Um, there are, well, and then we saw Google drop support for XMPP Federation in 2014. Um, in the case of both Facebook and Google Talk, there are still free clients you can use to communicate with people on those platforms, but they're not using standards. They're just, they're using their own way. They're you know, figuring out enough of the protocol to make communication work, but it's not using the standards and, and those systems are always very fragile, can break when the company decides to change something. We've also seen uh, big problems with email. Uh, Doc mentioned, you know, all the, the spam issues. If you've tried to run your own mail server lately for outbound email, it's incredibly difficult because of all the anti-spam measures that the major email providers have put in place. It's very hard to get your emails actually delivered to anybody. Uh, and even if you run your own mail server, you have to keep in mind that Google has your mail anyway. So one of our board members, Benjamin Mako Hill, did a study on his own email. It has lots of pretty graphs. Um, I do recommend checking out the URL. He found that even though he doesn't use Gmail, more than 50% of all the emails he's sent uh, still ended up at Google because the people that you're writing to or somebody on the thread that you're writing to uses Google. So mail is now a very um, centralized communication format. And even though there's a standard beneath it, uh, people are putting such restrictions and gateways on it that it's a functioning like a, a protocol that's not very friendly to some of the things that we're concerned about. And of course, spam is a legitimate issue. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but it's also, I think, partly an excuse. Or at a minimum, we have different priorities here. Companies are working very hard. Large email providers are working very hard to protect their users from spam, and in doing so, they don't care too much about collateral damage caused to people that might want to run their own mail server, because that's not their constituency. So it's kind of a you know, ecological, environmental issue we have here that affects us more than it affects them. So as I mentioned, I think communication tools are an especially important area to be free software. Um, so why? Well, the first thing is, to identify ourselves as a movement, free software, communication and collaboration, is those are things that we're supposed to be good at. We're supposed to be the best at this. We work with people all around the world on, and collaborate on code, documentation, you know, strategies for promoting our projects. Uh, we, we started that, right? Uh, we made it possible with free software. And so the fact that we can't now have 
our basic communication tools be free software is just it's uh, demoralizing and, and I think it, it's something that we need to focus on for that reason alone. I think Bradley Kuhn at the at, uh, his keynote at the end of the day today is going to talk more about that aspect of free software projects using uh, non-free communication tools. Um, but I'm also going to talk about here more about the use of communication tools by people who aren't developers and aren't users and um, why even if they're never going to modify the code of the tool they're using, it's really important that that code be then those tools be free. And that's for reasons such as communication is so fundamental to all your other freedoms. You can't express yourself politically. Uh, you can't associate, create associations, communicate with friends, build organizations without communication tools. Journalists, press publications need communication tools. And when these tools aren't free, then the exercise of that freedom is also not free because the tools uh, filter everything that, that you are passing through them. There's also many privacy and surveillance concerns. Uh, if their tools aren't free, then you don't know who is monitoring the communications, who has access to them. And we've seen lots of cases of that. I'll highlight a few examples. Once someone has access to the messages, they can also often manipulate them, censor them, block them, modify them. And we're seeing plenty of cases of that with the existing proprietary tools. Security concerns, anything proprietary is an attack vector on your system. Uh, in that sense, it's no different from any other proprietary software, except that communication tools are so installed so ubiquitously that they're a particular concern. Uh, and I also think that they are an effective vector for free software adoption. So uh, at the FSF, what we're actually trying to do is get people to believe in the ideals of free software and support um, those ethics and see them as a priority more than we are trying to get actual software developed if we have to choose. But the two things are complementary when someone uses a great free tool, then they become interested in uh, what made that tool happen. And it also is a demonstration that, you know, if you, if you explain free software to someone who's never heard of it before, th they might think who's going to write code if they can't sell it uh, exclusively and they can't, you know, tell other people they're not allowed to copy it. And the existence of awesome free tools shows people that the world is possible, um, that people can live in freedom and have great tools. So great communication tools can achieve that uh, because, they're well, because they're so widely used. So I'm going to highlight just a few examples. I could fill up you know, the rest of the day talking about all the things that have happened with various proprietary communications tools. But just to highlight a few examples to support the argument here, uh, we know that Facebook spies on uh, messenger conversations. So Zuckerberg, in an interview, acknowledged that the algorithms on Facebook scan private communications, not just public postings. Um, and they this brings up an interesting distinction, which is important for understanding this area between a neutral communication platform and a moderated forum. Uh, and a moderated forum does what Facebook is doing. They're moderating all messages, no matter uh, whether who's, who's whether private or public. A neutral communication platform, we don't expect that, right? A neutral communication platform is like the telephone or the highway system. You're not trying to uh, moderate anything beyond the basic rules that are necessary to keep that system functioning. You don't say you can use the highway for this purpose, not for this purpose. You can make this kind of phone call. Um, but we're going to listen to make sure that you don't say the wrong things on your phone call. That doesn't really happen. So Facebook tries to say that this isn't done by a person. It's done by an algorithm, as if that makes it acceptable. But it's an algorithm written by a person or an algorithm generated by some program that was written by a person. So any way you slice it, it's a person uh, accessing your communications and potentially manipulating them. Also, we don't really believe that they only do this for purposes of stopping child pornography or other bad things. Because, for instance, the founder of uh, what WhatsApp, who had become part of Facebook, has now leaving over concerns reportedly about Facebook's push to use WhatsApp data for advertising purposes, which makes sense since they're an advertising company. So the fact that this is enough of a concern to cause the WhatsApp founder to leave sort of also makes us wonder more about whether Facebook's other claims um, about how they access and don't access data might be more suspect. And it's not just Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, Microsoft, banning offensive language on Skype. And I think you know this one raises a lot of eyebrows because people tend to think of Skype more in that neutral communication platform category, I think. They don't, it's not a moderated forum like Facebook 
they think of it as a telephone. And so it's more shocking to think that uh, Microsoft might be doing any kind of censorship there. And this one also, you'll notice, uh, seems to be actual employees doing this. So they're not even trying to have the separation that Facebook has of algorithms monitoring the communications rather than uh, people checking on them. The reports about the Microsoft terms seem to give employees a lot of discretion and latitude about when it's necessary to check in on other people's communications. Security issues, just as one example uh, with WhatsApp. Uh, this group found, security research group, identified an exploit that could allow people to bust into private chats and also to essentially forge messages, um, having messages be posted that seem to be attributed to somebody who didn't actually post them, which is of great concern uh, as we're trying to solve problems of fake news and uh, misinformation to be able to break into the system and manipulate who said what. And what they're saying is uh, pretty, that's a pretty bad kind of security problem. And as everyone would be quick to remind me, free software also has security problems. Uh, we have a lot with very cute names, Shellshock, Heartbleed, whatever. That's all software has security problems. But what's different about free software is, first of all, everybody can find those security problems um, by looking at the code. It's out there for anybody to see. Uh, we're not at the, uh, we don't have the, for one thing, smaller funnel of security researchers that spend time um, analyzing things from the outside as opposed to be able to look right in the box. And we're not dependent on one company with exclusive control over the actual information to disclose uh, when there's problems and when there's not. Plus, the thing to remember in, this, in these conversations is security against whom. And free software is the only kind of software that provides security against the developer and against the company, against any company that's distributing it because the user and other people can find issues and distribute repaired versions. So Apple is getting a lot of props lately for their in strong encryption practices, privacy practice, privacy practices to the point where a lot of security experts are recommending iPhones. Um, and this is very discouraging because in the short term, that might actually be true. It is possible that a piece of proprietary software in the short term is more secure against many kinds of exploits than any given piece of free software. But in the long term, we know that a precondition for actual security is for that source code itself and the product to be free software. Um, and in the Apple case, you can see a clear issue because Apple, as far as I know, controls the public key infrastructure uh, for their cryptography system. And so a message that you think is only be encrypted, being encrypted for you and one other person or for your three Apple devices and one other person could in process have another public key added to it and have that message get encrypted for Apple. I'm happy for someone to explain to me why that's not the case, but um, I think that they control, they have full control over the public key infrastructure, which gives them a little bit more power than they've um, confessed to. So these are some of the reasons why we've put uh, communications related topics on the high priority projects list. Um, we maintain a high priority projects list to draw attention to a relatively small number of projects that have great strategic importance to the goal of freedom for all computer users. And three of those projects uh, out of 11 relate to this topic. Um, I expect we'll be kicking off an update to this list pretty soon. We, we try to update it regularly. And if you would like to be the person leading that process, we are hiring for the program manager position that leads it. So if you're interested, please look at the job posting on fsf.org. So we have the free phone operating system. Uh, Replicant is currently the best candidate we have in that area. It's Android with the proprietary components removed. Um, I put that here because all of the proprietary systems listed earlier have mobile versions. Um, and because a free app to make phone calls on a cellular network doesn't do us a lot of good when it depends on a proprietary library to interface with the cellular modem, uh, which is the case on Android devices. And also because as uh, Moxie Marlin Spike, the developer behind Signal says, the phone's notification center has actually become the federation point for communication and for networks because users use multiple devices and multiple apps uh, multiple networks and the notification area on the phone is what brings them all together. So the phone has become the center of the you know, communication experience. Also, the phone's address book has become the user's social graph and social network since that's what's used in common by all of these apps. So the phone itself is really central to all of this. Uh, decentralization, federation, and self-hosting is another topic on the list. And real-time voice and video chat, which is directly related here. So at the FSF, we try to practice what we preach and use only free tools to do work within our organization. And 
just want to share what we use in rough order of importance here, or, or not importance, but the amount that we use them. Email is still number one. IRC actually is number two. Uh, vocal cords, vibrating air, I think that's still free. Uh, that's third, we use SIP. Uh, we talk to the rest of the world's phone system using the free software platform Asterisk. We run a GNU social instance, although we don't really use it for private messaging. We do a lot of public posting there. Same with Diaspora. We have uh, Jabber set up as kind of a backup to IRC. And Jitsi, we don't do a lot of video calls, but when we do, that's what we use. IRC, uh, you can find us on Freenode. These are just a few of my favorite channels that are FSF related channels. And I'm John SU01. Hope to see you there. There are many other free tools that we don't use uh, in the organization, but uh, I wanted to highlight Telegram, free but, um, because the server software that the client talks to is not free software. GNU Ring, which does uh, voice and video chat, as well as text, I believe, WebRTC. It's a protocol rather than a specific application, but um, it's important to know about. Mattermost replaces Slack. Fiddleby, well, we do use that at the FSF because I use it, but um, nobody else does. Enables you to talk to a whole bunch of uh, different communication platforms in a single IRC window. If you like IRC, I highly recommend it for coping with the rest of the world. Mastodon can do private messaging. Matrix and Riot, I know probably the least about. Uh, but um, are in this category. Signal, um, free but, that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Mumble, others that I missed. Carrier Pigeon, what's that? Tox, yes, that's, uh, that's one I've heard of. Get there, yeah, okay. Any developers of of uh, free communication systems in the room? Contributors? Okay, well, yeah. Can you use social? Yeah, right. Cool. So, my wish list for the perfect tool, you know, what I, the kinds of things I think we need to do uh, in order to win here. It's a big list. We have security. Uh, didn't mention reproducible builds yet, but any plan for security for the future should make sure that. You can build the tool from source code and get a hash, which is reproducible. So you know that the source code uh, that is supposedly used to use build this binary is actually the source code that was used to build the binary. Uh, the binary itself hasn't been modified. Uh, you need clients these days on all platforms. You have to have a mobile client, a web client, being careful to avoid proprietary JavaScript. Uh, you need to run on all the major operating systems. Those proprietary tools all meet uh, all have that level of um, compatibility. Uh, has to be able to show you puking rainbows, or you know what I really mean is, you guys don't even use Snapchat, do you? So I mean, I, I love the feeling that I might be like the biggest expert on proprietary tools in the room here. Uh, no, I don't use it, but uh, people love Snapchat filters, right? They can show you puking rainbows. They can turn you into uh, like uh, old timey like cowboy dude. Um, do you know there's actually a thing called Snapchat? Dysformia, dysmorphia, sorry, where plastic surgeons are seeing an increase in business because Snapchat filters are making people feel bad about their looks. Like, because some of the filters allow you to clean up your skin and things. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they have to be fun. That's the point. Like fun, fun goes a long way towards adoption and getting people to try something new. Uh, voice plus text, both um, multimedia, or what people call rich media. Sometimes the ability to share videos, pictures, um, not just text. Uh, being appropriate for intimate conversations, kind of connected to the whole privacy, security. Uh, it's a big thing people use tools for. Transparency of algorithms. We're going to have to deal with the same problems that Facebook deals with, with child pornography and uh, lots of other you know, kinds of harassment and really undesirable kinds of communication. If we're using algorithms to deal with any of those things, they need to be transparent so that people know how these tools function. Reliability. No missing or delayed messages. Nothing is worse than... Uh, sending somebody a message and having them never receive it. Nothing will turn people off of a tool faster than that, and nothing has been more frustrating for me about Jabber than that over the years. Emoji. How else are people going to read Moby Dick? Um, support for multiple simultaneous clients. People have phones, tablets, laptops, all connected. They want to receive messages where at whichever one they're looking at at the time. They don't want the message to go to their phone when they're looking at their laptop. 
uh, presence indication. I, for one, hate the typing bubble. Um, I wish it would go away. You don't need to know when I'm typing. You'll see the message when it arrives. But a lot of people like it, and so it needs to be there. And as well as an indication of presence in general, on IRC, we have the away message. Uh, we had you know, status uh, back in AIM days, but that's an important component to let people know if you're available in there. There shouldn't be any secret server infrastructure. So when you talk about software on servers, you have to be careful. It's not really the same thing as free software versus proprietary. The case is usually that the server software just has never been released at all, which means it's neither free nor proprietary. Uh, but we don't want that, right? With these tools, a lot of the scary things are, with the proprietary tools, a lot of the scary things are happening on the server, right? And so we want the code behind whatever server, if there is a server involved in the free communication tool chain to be released as well. Stability, true for any software, attractive interface. Uh, I threw this one on there because I'm just a personal fan. It's not necessary, but direct messaging support for physical proximity. Why do we have to go all the way out to you know, the ISP and back again in order to talk to other people sitting in the same room? If it can be done, it's much more resilient to uh, potentially to privacy and surveillance concerns. Ability to hit a button and wipe out all the messages. Uh, very requested feature in secure applications. This last thing, listening to users, I think is really important. I think it's a big part of why we sort of fell behind in the last several years is paying attention to what people want out of their tools. It you know pains me that everybody doesn't just want to use Emacs. Um, and I, I actually did write a mobile communication interface in Emacs for the Open Milco, so I could send my text messages and make phone calls with Emacs. But that doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for most people. So pay attention to what users are saying, and projects have good systems set up for collecting feedback and acting on it. I think these things will really help us succeed. Um, you'll notice that I did not include decentralization and federation in the wish list. Uh, and that's not because I don't think it should be there, it's because I'm not sure it should be there. And let's talk about why by way of talking about Signal, which is the, as far as I've seen, the kind of front runner for um, applications that meet the most of the items in that list. Works on lots of platforms, does all kinds of communication, it's free software, the client's QPL v3 or later, the server's AGPL v3 or later. Uh, it is centralized. Um, which means that you have to talk to a server. Uh, but with the server software being available, you can, and people have done, um, set up their own server. So it so happens, oh, and the but that I wanted to highlight earlier is that as far as I know, and I would love to be set uh, to be told otherwise, it still requires proprietary software to build. Signal for a long time depended on Google Play services on the phone which are proprietary, that's no longer the case, which is awesome. Um, and I think the next step might be to just eliminate it from the build dependency. I don't think that's been done yet. Um, there's also some concern that's because it's a build dependency, I don't know what ends up in the binary as a result of that. Um, so if someone would put my mind to rest about those two things, then uh, I would be, I would see no issues here except for distribution. It's not an F-Droid right now, which is the free software Android application app store. It's not there because of a disagreement uh, about some security practices, like how do you get users security updates immediately when F-Droid doesn't have a built-in way to do that, um, and who signs the binary. So when you get the binary from the Signal site, uh, the APK, it's signed by the developer. You can verify that. Um, what happens when F-Droid rebuilds the software, which is something that's good, because that makes sure that the source code actually corresponds to the binary, but then the signature doesn't match. So reproducible builds, that's the answer, I guess. Uh, Signal is not going to be federated. Uh, Moxie made that very clear. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of his reasoning. I recommend reading that article. It raises some very interesting points, but the main one is that federation um, and standardization slows things down. So uh, WhatsApp, you know, even though it's proprietary, they were able to push encryption out to all users with the, the press of a button, right? If, if they were part of a standardized network, they wouldn't be able to do that because that would break other clients. So his point, his biggest point is that federation and trying to support interoperability of all clients around a standard slows that down. I think that's something that needs to be considered. Um, and in free software, it's kind of less important because if we meet the rest of the items on the list, like the server software being free, published, and the client software being free, 
published, uh, some of the risks of centralization are minimized because you can set that up if you want to move away from that centralized server, someone else can start a new one. So you have kind of a built-in check on the kinds of abuses that can happen with the combination of proprietary software and centralization. So I raise this as an interesting topic for further discussion. I've been always a fan of decentralization, distribution, federation, uh, but I do think that um, we might need to think about challenges like spam and harassment, how do you stop those on distributed federated systems? There's no central point of control. Identity management, discoverability. How do you find other users on distributed platforms? I don't know if how many people have tried Mastodon, but trying to find which Mastodon instance somebody is on can be challenging. Any kind of distributed uh, platform is going to have the same sort of challenge. Terrorism, <laughs> um, not really, but sort of. Uh, there's been communications that have escalated around the world. There was an example in India, for example, that have been um, incitements to violence, and they've been forged fake news communications that led to actual violence. And how do we address that? That's a social problem. Addressing it, the communication tool is not the only way to address it, but in any event, free software is going to have to explain its approach here. So what's the narrative? You know, do we just say, well, this is a communication tool, we don't, you know, drug dealers use the roads, uh, traffickers use the roads, um, it's a, it's a cost of freedom that we have to solve at another level, or do we actually try to implement solutions uh, that can work without sacrificing people's freedoms? The business model, I'm gonna fly through this because it is not my area of expertise, but uh, get money from the WhatsApp guy, that's the business model for uh, free communication tools. It seems to be working for other people. Now, um, grant funding, the Guardian Project does a lot of great work in this area, and they've uh, done, you know, they've been receiving some grant money in order to do that work. Advertising, I, I don't know, someone will figure out how to link these things to make money from advertising. Private or large deployments. Uh, user donations, LibreOffice has done very well with prompting users to donate $10 when they install or upgrade the software. Customization, support, training, those are typical um, free software business models that don't rely on selling a shrink-wrapped product. Ways you can help, I don't think I have to tell this room, don't use Slack for your projects. Uh, but you know your individual rejection of non-free tools goes a long way. Don't be intimidated by the network effect. The network effect is obviously a thing. Billions of people are using these proprietary tools, but that is an aggregation of individual choices. And those choices are very fickle. They change quickly. It looks indomitable until suddenly it changes and MySpace is no more. Right? This is something that happens, and people are willing to use more tools. Don't like anybody that tells you, I don't want to add another app or another program to my communication life. These people are using 14 different streaming programs at home right now. They're using 10 different communication programs. If there's a reason to use it, people will check it out. You know, if it's fun, if their friends are using it, if somebody that they trust like you um, brings it up and asks it to start using it for your communications, that can work. Also, use more copylefts. Um, Many of these proprietary tools actually have chunks of free software under permissive licenses in them. How would the world look now if people used more copyleft licenses for their code so that that couldn't happen? Uh, like Simon highlighting the, the free writers. The FSF is gonna do our best to help through the methods that we have, um, fiscal sponsorship, where people can donate to specific projects through us. We provide infrastructure using all free software on Libre booted servers for um, projects to do their collaboration on. Uh, we help find people volunteers. Uh, we provide help with licensing best practices. We can bring publicity and attention with the audience that we have to projects that are doing great work. And of course, if we keep getting uh, increasing amounts of funding, we'll do our best to fund some of these projects directly. I'm optimistic about this for a few reasons. Um, the Libre, five, Libre M5 phone, when I mentioned the free phone system, the best option there is currently Replicant, but we will hopefully have another option come April, which is a GNU Linux powered phone produced by Purism that will uh, be all free software. And they've put a lot of attention onto the communication, the text um, and video communication aspect as well. Uh, also the fact that they raised over $2.8 million for this phone, which was 188% of their crowdfunding goal shows that uh, there's people want this. Right, there's resources out there, there's motivation, there's, there's demand. Most people are currently using Android. I try to remember that's, an op that's a reason for optimism, even though most people are using it with proprietary apps and drivers. 
uh, free software, the basic framework of free software is in more people's pockets than anything else. It's the most widely used general operating system in the world right now, general purpose operating system. Signal, like I said, uh, the popularity of that is reasons for optimism, and I can announce that Replicant has received a $200,000 donation from Handshake uh, to the FSF to spend to help the Replicant project. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to some of the great things that can come out of that. So these things are signs that the resources are out there, um, which means that there is a possible network effect that we can build, and we can actually make changes here. So even though we've been losing, I think we can turn it around. I think listening to the users and raising the priority of free tools within our communities as well as with the uh, other people in our social circles, families, professional lives is the way to do it. So thank you. I totally lied, and I don't think I left you any time to tell me I'm wrong, so uh, you'll have to do that later. <laughs>